Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the BSA K-12 meeting here in March. Um, just gonna give a, a minute. And as I talk through some kind of ground rules and everything, I'm sure we'll have more people joining us. This is well attended, you should know. Um, the topic that we have today is all gender facility configurations. Um, something that we is near and dear to, to all of our hearts. I know we've got a lot of people here. We've got uh, parents of, of students. Um, we've got plenty of architects, of course. Uh, we've got um, the MSBA and I believe representatives from the DESE here. Um, so this is great. Hopefully we'll have rich conversation. Um, the format for today will be a bit of a presentation and sharing from panel members and some parents. I'm gonna ask that everybody stay muted and if you do have a question, please put it in the chat box. Um, for those of you who don't know that where that is, it should be at the lower bottom of your screen. You can see a little icon for chat. You can click on that. It'll open up a sidebar. Um, we will probably not take questions during the presentation, but if you have uh, some point of clarification or, or something that's really pressing, um, perhaps you can raise your hand or put that in the chat box, but we'll try to hold off on questions. We are recording this session. So for those of you that have to jump off or if those that would like to share it with others, uh, it will be available through the BSA website, through the knowledge communities for K-12 schools. Um, I think that's about it. We also have um, put in for, we're, we're pending approval for continuing education units for those that are interested. There is a link that's in the chat box right now um, so for all of you architects that are looking for CEUs, please, um, you might want to click on that link so you can put in your name and your so registration. Bob, I, I don't see it anymore. You might have to repaste it in there for folks. Okay, let me do that. <clears throat> I will see if I can do that. Sure while people are, uh, while we get started. So I'll try to do that right from the beginning. Um, but I really wanna just turn this over. Um, I'm Robert Bell, I'm the BSA K-12 co-chair. I'm joined by Tina Stanislavski. Um, we have with us today and we're excited that uh, Matt Rice from Sims Maney McKee, a senior project architect and principal who co-leads the K-12 practice there um, has brought this topic to us and um, is working with this panel. Um, he has over 20 years of experience designing forward-thinking schools. We're really excited, and I'll turn it over to you, Matt, to, um, to tell us a little bit more and maybe in introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to everybody. It, I'll tell you, it, just, it warms my heart to see that we have 84 um, attendees to this particular presentation. Um, it's really a fantastic turnout and, and really such an important topic, and we really appreciate everyone's time and the ability to share some information, really the importance of this particular topic. Um, it, just as a quick precursor before we get into uh, the introductions, I just I want to point out to everybody the fact that um, 30, 40 years ago, we were having similar conversations about the inclusion of um, accessible um, stalls um, in terms of toilet facilities. And while it's not a perfect analogy, um, um, I have a son who grew up um, having a very difficult time in school. Uh, he was he was a, a gay uh, male, and um, actually, um, unfortunately, uh, resulted in a very deep depression and a suicide attempt while he was in high school. Uh, fortunately, he's made it through it. He's doing fantastic today. But uh, I still try to stay connected to the commission and any work in schools to try and make them safer and uh, for all students uh, moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Roger. Dr. Homan. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Homan. I am the assistant superintendent in the Waltham Public Schools. Um, and my connection to this work is that I've been working with um, Matt and Lorraine Finnegan, who I see here too, um, on the Waltham High School project. And I've been a member of the school building committee on that project. Um, I am also a former English teacher, one who has always really uh, worked to ensure that there's representation in the curriculum of all students' identities and experiences and cultures, and have you know really tried to make sure that in partnership with our architects in Waltham, that we have built a school that is really for the kids and allows them to be who they are when they are at school. Our kids told us 
that they needed to have a school that was inclusive of our LGBTQIA um, of their peers. And so we've been really advocating for all gender restrooms in the high school. It has been a, a road. I was on the school design committee that initially had this conversation. We've also been advocating for all gender locker rooms. Um, and so I'm excited to be here and to talk about this. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, it's very important for our students. We've heard a lot of stories like the one Landon shared from our own students. We have a safe house just down the, um, just down the road from the high school where uh, students who have been displaced from their homes because of their gender identity or um, because of their, home, their um, sexuality and their identity have come to live here. And so we have a lot of these youth in our schools. So um, that's my link, that's my work, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I am gonna share my screen just very quickly. Um, I think it is helpful to just give a quick um, understanding of the organization of what we're gonna cover here today. Um, so the learning objectives, like any good AIA um, credited presentation, we have four of them that we're trying to cover. Um, this first one that we're just already jumped into and we'll continue in a moment um, is really the why um, as to the, what the topic uh, really embodies. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, trying to make sure that we can all empathize with the students that um, can really benefit from thinking, rethinking um, how the toilet room design are typically done in schools. Um, once we get through that, um, I'll bring the slides back and we actually have some diagrams that we'll run through with everyone. Uh, to show you just what we've been doing um, in Waltham uh, at the high school there as part of the new design uh, that we're working on, um, as well as some precedents that exist out there um, in, the, in the country really um, to try and just explain what some of the opportunities are there and what some of the constraints are. I just wanted to give an overview of framework and I will stop sharing now and we can definitely jump right into um, just again, talking through the why. Um, so Jeff, if you wanna maybe just get us going and then we can uh, walk through the uh, individual experiences. Sure. I'm going to um, just show this uh, quickly here. This is the uh, the student anti-discrimination law that came about in the early 1970s in the wake of the civil rights movement. Uh, when it came about, there were five protected categories. Uh, that were protected uh, race, color, sex, religion, and national origin. In 1993, sexual orientation was added. And then in 2012, gender identity was added. So now there are seven categories. And um, what, we, what we'd like to say is uh, that this is the no flinch moment for administrators and school personnel, that equal is equal, that um, when a category is protected by law, it um, it means that um, you know a student needs to be treated like every st other student in every and have access to educational opportunities in um, in every way and um, um, and that means even the areas that make people uh, uncomfortable sometimes, which are often bathrooms, locker rooms, uh, curriculum, athletics. Um, uh, but discomfort is not a reason to treat people inequitably. So uh, we'd like to just put that out right from the beginning, that gender identity is a protected category by law. And I just wanna, from the start, give a shout out to Matt um, for just really being just in your position, just being such an incredible uh, supporter and advocate for uh, students and to have, um, to be really approaching this uh, and, um, creating conversation regarding this topic and bringing awareness to it. So gender identity is new for many people. So the research shows that 90% of people have somebody close in their life that's lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And the numbers have doubled in the last uh, five to 10 years um, from 8% to 16% of people say they have somebody close to their life who's transgender. And just for comparison purposes, 18% of people say they think they've seen a ghost. So more people say they think they've seen a ghost than know somebody who's transgender. And that's why I really appreciate that, that, uh, that the young people and the families who are putting a face to this topic, just like people's hearts and minds were changed by more people coming out as gay, lesbian, and bisexual, with the increased visibility in the media and with people being courageous and sharing their personal experiences like Landon and like you're going to hear, 
um, some of the other uh, folks on the panel sharing theirs. That's what really has um, educated people and, um, and made a difference in moving this conversation along. So with that, I am, I am delighted that some parents are here. And I'd uh, like to start with uh, Molly, who um, has been a mover and shaker, not only advocating for her family and her children, but for her entire school district. So Molly, if you'd like to introduce yourself and share what your connection is with this topic, that would be great. Sure. Thanks, everyone, for being here today to discuss this important topic. Thank you, uh, Matt. Uh, my name is Molly Gillis. I'm a parent in Arlington Schools. We've had, um, and my daughter is transgender. Um, she started verbalizing um, her identity pretty much as soon as she was able to talk it around and, and string sentences together at three. Um, she started saying things like, isn't it strange? My body's telling me I'm a girl. Um, and so, you know, things, you know, moved along pretty well. I, she actually socially transitioned, which Landon will, will share more about the definitions in a few minutes. But um, what that meant for her was uh, she changed her pronouns to she, her, hers. She grew her hair out long. She started wearing um, what she lovingly referred to as girl clothes. Uh, and she started using uh, the girls' bathrooms at school. She made that transition, uh, her, she started to make it her first year of kindergarten um, in Arlington Public Schools. She took kindergarten twice because she was a little on the young age. And so her second year of kindergarten, she was able to go enter kindergarten into, in her correct gender, which was pretty incredible for her. Um, for us, I, I will say in kindergarten, the, the bathrooms, there's one bathroom and it's in the classroom. So we didn't really have to think much about it in kindergarten. Um, in first grade was when the rubber sort of started to hit the road because um, she had to choose which bathroom to use. And she wanted to use uh, the girls' bathroom, which the principals, the teachers, um, the staff, everyone was very supportive of that. However, um, there were some kids who remembered our daughter pre-transition. And there were some incidents where uh, a couple of kids said, you, you can't use this bathroom. You're not, you're not a girl, you're a boy, um, which was deeply hurtful to um, our daughter, but also uh, it, got, it got to the point where she wouldn't go into the bathroom. She wouldn't go into the girl's bathroom. So she would come home and tell me, I'm either gonna wait till no one is in there. So I think she was kind of like sticking her head in and looking underneath the stalls to make sure it was all clear or she was holding it, which we all know is, is not a good strategy. Um, and then there was a um, all gender bathroom or it was really a staff bathroom. It wasn't at that point designated as all gender. Um, and she would sometimes slip down there, but similar to Landon's experience, it was two floors down from where she was in class. So um, that just was not sustain sustainable. And it was around that time that, uh, you know, I reached out to the GEMS program at Children's, which is world renowned. And they put me in touch with Jeff who has been um, just transformational for our family our school and ultimately our community. But uh, Jeff came in and, and worked with, um, with me and, and with the support of our principal also worked with the teachers and the staff to figure out how to have conversations with the kids and also the families um, to explain some of these issues. But the bathroom, the bathroom situation is something to me that seems like can be can be fixed with some forethought and some planning as you all are doing today and it really just does make a huge difference in for these kids to not be called out and just to you know be normal kids with everybody else and and um and feel safe and feel uh comfortable and like their routine is not disrupted and at the end of the day that's all that's all she wanted and that's all we wanted was just to contribute to her happiness so mm -hmm. um Thank you again. Jeff, did I leave anything out? That's that's a great start, Molly. Thank you. Okay. And and AJ, I know that you were a little bit tight for time, so I want to make sure you had a chance to share. I don't see you on the screen here. This is our life now, all these little blocks here. But AJ, are you are you able to unmute yourself and are you on? I am. I am. Good morning. Okay. I wanted Good morning. to great. Oh, there you are, AJ. Great to here. have you here. Thanks. Thank you. So I can, um, so I am uh, a non-gender conforming parent of a transgender student in the elementary schools up here in Salem. And I've done a lot of work with our schools. Oh, you're going um, in and out a little bit here. And we, 
Oh, sorry, I'm outside, so. <laughs> um, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Great. Is that better? I think so. Okay, so um, he started out in preschool as he is today, and um, we went into the, which was great, the, the preschool had ungenderified the bathroom, so it was six of you here, six of you there, it didn't really matter. And then we got to the public schools and things were different. And so we've, uh, we had an issue in uh, kindergarten with kids looking under the stall and making uh, comments. And so then when we got up into like first grade, he stopped using the bathroom, and was holding most of the days. And then in third grade, he was holding and we ended up in the hospital with a kidney infection because he was too afraid to use the bathrooms at school. Um, for him, it's more or less having stalls that are private um, or, you know, let's say in use um, and uh, are occupied rather. Um, he's now in doing great. He's in remote right now. Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you, Adrian. Yep. Um, so for, I think it's true for most families with kids, like the bathrooms shouldn't be a big deal. It should just be everyone going in using the bathroom like they do in Europe and in South Africa when we went to visit there. Um, it's just better for them not to have that fear of, of um, what's gonna happen when I go in or if someone sees something or says something. Um, so taking that element out of, out of the public schools, it would be a great thing for our students. All right, thanks so much, AJ. I appreciate it. I know that you were fitting a lot of stuff in today and your story is just so uh, important and powerful and poignant. And I'm sorry that what your son went through and thanks for being here and, and uh, speaking about it. Take, take care, thanks. And Alexis, I'm glad to see you, a parent I just met recently who, um, as soon as you began the conversation with me when we started talking, I recognized that your voice would be very important to, to have included here today. So uh, wonderful to see you and thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I am Alexis Madison and I use um, she, her pronouns. And I have a transgender son who is seven years old now and in first grade. Um, I am new to all of this. Um, while it's not new that my son um, identified as a boy at three years old, like most kids do, um, I'll start by saying I think what's so interesting is if we start taking the stigma out of it earlier on, like in preschool, all kids use the same bathroom. They they had shower curtains at our preschool, um, so. Uh, the teachers could go in and out easily and help kids with the bathroom. These kids have no problem with sharing a bathroom. I think as they get older, we start compartmentalizing them and therefore they start putting it in their minds. Um, so as I heard some of these stories, I thought, you know, a lot of the, the, the kids that are transgender know at a very young age and probably hold back on a lot of it for many, many reasons but maybe some of them are the fact that gender then becomes a thing. It wasn't a thing before. Um, so, you know, taking one piece out for them might help kids express their gender earlier on, um, which obviously is positive for so many reasons that they can start um, working through that and being their true self earlier on. Um, so I'll, I'll paint this picture and then kind of, um, I guess, illustrate how bathrooms come into it. Um, when my son was maybe four or five, um, we were at school, there was a program being run by, uh, um, I don't know, a, a program outside our school. And it was supposed to be a fun day for all the kids and there were games. And at the end of it was the big tug of war. And they said, boys on this side, girls on this side. And my child who is as athletic and, and competitive, um, stopped dead in his tracks the other two you know went to the girl side and it was the first time in my life that i saw that gender can be very confusing um and it really 
when given the choice and you're unsure can stop you. Um, so with the bathrooms, it was only recently, um, we've, we've always instilled that our child can be whomever they want to be. And we sat down and he said to me, mom, I don't want to use the girl's bathroom anymore. Fine. No problem. At school, we can do that. Um, I said, we can, we can figure that out. So, so the options were, um, you can use the boy's bathroom, but we have the nurse's bathroom as Landon calls out. And we have the quote unquote teacher's bathroom, um, both on sort of separate sides of the school. Um, my child ended up saying, I'll use the, the teacher's bathroom and, and let it be known that before this, um, we did have a transgender student at our school. The same options were given. Not much work has been done towards this. So this is, I didn't know bathrooms were gonna be my big thing, but they're gonna be my big thing. Um, and I checked in with him, um, you know, a few days later and I said, how's it going? Um, are you using the teacher's bathroom or the one that that's open to you? No, I'm sticking with the girl's bathroom. I said, okay, well, is there a reason? Um, yeah, you know, with COVID only so many kids are allowed in at the same time. So I feel, I feel okay. Now, this is the kid that before sort of having to sort through this for the first time said, mom, I really wish the bathroom was at the end of a long, long hallway so no one would have to see me. That's not what I want my kid thinking. That shows me that child wants to hide from their reality. And to me, that breaks my heart. Um, I'm sorry, I'm new to this, but I think of bathrooms as a human right in our society as much as shelter and food and all the things that we try to give kids, the bathroom should not be the thing. Um, you know, as AJ was saying, um, it can lead to so many health problems. And I think if my child's gonna sit there in class and have to learn, but at the same time have to think about what bathroom am I gonna use? They're not learning and they're worrying about something they shouldn't have to. So while it's such a simple, silly thing, I mean, you, you would never think you would put so much worth in something like this, but I think it shows this is just one really small kind of insignificant part of being transgender and all the other things you have to think about. Um, this just shouldn't be it shouldn't be a conversation because I think kids, for the most part, if you put it out there and you sort of open their minds to acceptance and the fact that the symbol on the door with a dress and the other one with a pair of pants, that's not that's not who everyone is. And frankly, I think those you know graphics should probably be thrown by the wayside too. Um, but I think. I think if we start teaching more acceptance earlier on, the better off these kids are gonna be earlier on and the easier the transition's gonna be for these kids, which I think I speak for my son who, who has a voice and has a parent who can do this, but I think there are probably so many other kids that don't have a voice and don't have a parent and no one to advocate for them. And so I advocate for them hoping that there's one part of their day that they don't have to worry about. So thank you for putting the time into this. Alexis, thank you so much for being here and for sharing that. And there's already some appreciations in the chat for you and um, in your openness and courage and sharing it, what the difference it's making um, to increase people's awareness and recognize why this is important. So. Please, Thank people, you. continue to use the chat. Thank you. Um, and uh, to express, and I know that there are other parents here who have a personal connection with the topic, too. Um, you're welcome to uh, share anything, if you like, in the chat or on mute to, to share what your own experience has been around this. Um, I think, um, you know, that was just, that was so powerful. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, 
I appreciate the people are actually using the chat to um, continue the conversation too, because we are uh, limited in our time here. Kim, I didn't know if you had um, wanted to share or summarize that uh, what you had heard from. I know that one or two students wrote things um, just to uh, round this out before Landon just does a little bit around terminology, just so that everybody is on the same page with information that we have. Sure, yeah, thank you all for sharing your experiences. I would love to read um, a story from a 16 year old 10th grade non-binary student that attends a high school here in Boston. So they shared when the option to go back in school in person was first announced at my school, I like many students was both excited and anxious. On top of the list of my anxieties was having to use the bathroom at school or more specifically having to choose which bathroom to use at school. It's always been more complicated for me. I know that whichever bathroom I choose, I get weird looks. If I choose to use the boys bathroom, I could potentially be outing myself as trans to someone I wasn't ready to come out to. Even if I did feel safe using either of the bathrooms, neither of the genders on the bathroom seemed to fit how I saw my own self. My parents signed me up for hybrid, but for these reasons, I chose to call in sick every day and to do my classes from home. After a few weeks, my parents pushed me to try it out and go to school. I planned to go to the bathroom before school and not drink any water while there but I still ended up needing to use the bathroom while I was in the building. To my surprise, when I got to the bathroom, it was a single stall, all gender bathroom. I was able to use the bathroom without fearing for my safety or betraying my own sense of self. Ever since then, fear around bathrooms hasn't prevented me from going to school. I've been able to participate in my in-person classes, eat full lunches and stay hydrated and come out to my friends, peers and teachers on my own terms. Like me, many students worry about which bathroom they're going to use when they go to school. And like me, they all deserve the chance to feel safe and comfortable at school. So I wanted to uplift that story and it really resonates with me um, that often the single stall gender neutral bathroom is the best option that we have if it is there at all. Um, but it shouldn't be our end goal um, because oftentimes, as you've heard, the single stall bathroom is in the nurse's office, it's, it's isolated, it's hard to find. Um, and I found too that it may be an accessible option for disabled students. So I often don't wanna interrupt a disabled student's day by using that restroom. Um, and that's been the case for me in my K through 12 experience in college in public spaces. Seeking out the single stall restroom is the best gender neutral option, but when there has been multi stall gender neutral restrooms that has been the most affirming most comfortable and most safe experience that that I've experienced myself. Um, and I just wanted to also share that the the glisten school climate survey, which is a national study that came out in 2019. 45% of LGBTQ students shared they were avoiding the bathroom during their day-to-day -day lives at school. This is impacting a lot of students um, in our lives. And the last thing I just wanted to say is something that I learned from another educator, which is how can we think about transforming our schools rather than having navigational spaces? So often trans and non-binary students are navigating systems and spaces and bathrooms that weren't necessarily built with them in mind. And that's why I'm so grateful for this conversation, how we can be more creative and innovative and transform our school building so that all of our students are feeling safe and supported. Thanks, Kim. Yes, we, we've heard far too many stories where students are avoiding bathrooms, they're not eating or drinking so that they don't have to go to the bathroom during the day. Um, you know, like the stories you've heard, students holding it till they get home, sometimes having accidents as they're running from the bus to come in because they haven't gone to the bathroom um, all day, uh, students getting eating disorders, um, you know, stories like AJ's child who had to be hospitalized for kidney infections. I mean, this is, uh, it's, it is a civil rights issue. And just like we said, equal is equal, you can't treat a student as being equal in all areas of their lives except the ones that make people uncomfortable without undermining the rest. And, um, and we talk about the comfort stretch and panic zone that, you know, learning happens when we're, we're, we're in our stretch zone and schools need to be places of constructive discomfort where learning takes place. And um, that's the growth mindset. Uh, and so I really appreciate that 
the role that you have in actually being part of these conversations and recognizing the importance. So I just wanted Matt just briefly to have Landon just to define a few terms just so that people are all on the same page regarding what we're talking about. We're using the terms like transgender and social transitioning. And I know that people have varying levels of exposure and exposure to this topic that like people are talking about, wait, kids are transitioning at this young age. What does that mean? Are you talking about medically transitioning or what social transitioning. So Landon is just going to talk a little bit about social and medical transitioning, define a few terms um, quickly, and then we can move on to some of the, um, the codes and design information. All right. Before you get started, Landon, um, Jeff, I just want to let you know your audio is a little choppy. I don't know if maybe there's options that you can explore. Oh, yeah. but so, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I appreciate your time. I'm going to get closer to, uh, I will get closer to the Wi-Fi here. Thanks. Yeah, so like Jeff said, to just briefly go over some terminology because people come into these things with different levels of knowledge around what some of these words mean. So it's not really about memorizing definitions or being an expert, but just being more familiar with some of the words we're using so that people are on the same page. So when we're talking about um, transgender students, non-binary students, we're talking about people whose gender identity is different from their sex assigned at birth. So sex assigned at birth being an assignment made at or before birth based on a person's external genitalia, but it also includes things like your hormone, your hormones and your chromosomes, primary and secondary sexual characteristics, the things that come with the onset of puberty. Um, and so when we're talking about biological sex, we tend to think of it in a very binary way that there's male and female, but there are also people who are intersex, which might mean that they have ambiguous genitalia, but you know, there's a range of medical conditions that could result in someone being intersex. And oftentimes it's not outwardly or physically apparent. So it could be, um, you know, having hormone levels that are not what we would typically associate with someone's sex assigned at birth um, or having, you know, two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. So people might be familiar with the term hermaphrodite, but that refers to someone with two fully formed sets of reproductive organs. And that's not possible in people. There are certain fish and insects and things that can be hermaphrodites, but people can be intersex, meaning that their uh, biological sex is not fully male or female. So being intersex doesn't necessarily make somebody transgender or LGBT, but it's just to kind of show that we have no idea what's underneath people's clothes. We have no idea what people's hormones and chromosomes are unless they choose to share that information. So biological sex, that's the assignment made at birth, which is different from someone's gender identity. Um, so for a transgender person, their biological sex is not consistent with their gender identity. So when I tell people that I'm a transgender man, sometimes people think that I'm transitioning to be female. Um, no, I transitioned from female to male. So I'm a transgender man, transgender boy, transgender guy. Those are all referring to people who were assigned female birth and I identify as male. Transgender woman, transgender girl would be somebody who was born assigned male at birth and identifies her gender as female. Um, non-binary might also be a new word for people, which also falls under the transgender umbrella. So non-binary um, is sort of an umbrella term for people whose gender identity is not strictly male or female. They might lean more towards, you know, identifying as male or female. They might be completely androgynous. It might fluctuate. Um, so if you have a student who identifies as non-binary, um, their transition might look a little bit different. They might not want to switch from one bathroom to the other. They would probably prefer to use a gender neutral or all gender bathroom. Um, they might not use he and her pronouns. They might prefer to use a singular they pronoun, um, which can be confusing for people to use intentionally, but with practice, um, you know, that sort of shows students that you're a supportive adult. So that's under gender identity. So a transgender person, their gender identity is different from their biological sex. And so transgender people will often transition. So like Jeff had said, you know, there's the medical aspect of transitioning, which could include, you know, cross hormone therapy or surgeries, but we tend to focus more on social transition. Um, so that refers to the aspects of transition that don't just affect the person transitioning, but people interacting with them. So, you know, social transition looks different for everyone, um, but that usually includes things like a name and pronoun change. Um, you know, maybe a change in how that person is presenting themselves through their clothing or their hairstyle or things like that. Um, and also, you know, what bathrooms and locker rooms people use. Those are all part of a social transition. So when we're talking about young students transitioning, you know, preschool, elementary school, middle school, we're only talking about a social transition. They're the earliest possible medical intervention might be 
right at the start of puberty, um, a, a student might be prescribed a hormone blocker, which is an implant that delays the onset of puberty, which is completely reversible. If that implant is taken out, they would resume puberty. That's consistent with their assigned sex of birth. Um, and so people might take a hormone blocker so that if they choose to medically transition further down the line, they don't have to go through puberty twice. And also to buy that student and their family some time to decide what the next step in their transition is. So when we're talking about young students transitioning, we're not performing surgery on kids. Um, you know, this is all a social transition. Um, and the other piece of that is gender expression. So that's the way that people express their gender. Um, and so, you know, that's really determined based on, you know, cultural aspects where you live in the world and what time period you exist in, you know, what it means to be a man or a woman now looks different than it did 100 years ago or in different parts of the world. So in our culture, you know, pretty much everything is gendered from clothing to hairstyles to mannerisms to interests and, you know, all of these sort of things are gendered and we've come a long way in our culture that your gender expression doesn't necessarily um, say anything about your sexual orientation or your gender identity, that men can be more feminine and women can be more masculine. And that doesn't, you know, just because you know one of these um, identities on these charts doesn't mean you know um, the rest. And, you know, sometimes it does predict the other. We assume that if someone's born male, they will identify as a boy or a man. They'll present themselves masculinely and they'll be attracted to girls or women. But in reality, you know, these things are all separate from each other. Um, so sexual orientation, that's the last uh, continuum that we have on under definitions. And that's one that people have a little bit more exposure to, um, you know, sexual orientation has been part of the conversation, um, you know, for the past several decades, people are a little bit more familiar with that. Um, but sexual orientation is referring to who someone's romantically or sexually attracted to. Um, and so when we talk about transgender people, um, people might say, if you're transgender, does that mean that you're gay, you know, LGBT that, you know, they all go together. Um, and so, you know, for transgender people, they can be of any sexual orientation. Um, and when we talk about the words people used to describe their sexual orientation, we're basing that on their gender identity, not their biological sex. So if you have a transgender woman who was uh, assigned male at birth, identifies as female, she's transitioned and lives her life as a woman. If she's only attracted to other women, she would probably identify as a lesbian, even though she was assigned male at birth. We're, we're using these words based on how people identify their gender, not their sex assigned at birth. And I think the last piece around terminology that people um, are curious about is, you know, at what age are people aware of this for sexual orientation? You know, that's right around puberty between the ages of nine and 11, people are becoming aware of their sexual orientation. They're not necessarily acting on that, but having an idea of who they're romantically or sexually attracted to. Um, and if that person is not straight, then typically they're not disclosing that information until, you know, around 13, 14, 15 years old, that number is getting younger and it depends a lot on the support that they get um, and if they feel comfortable sharing that information but really around middle school you know entering middle school most students are aware of who they're attracted to and if they're lgbt they're not necessarily telling people until the end of middle school so sexual orientation you know that's around middle school age gender identity is oftentimes established much earlier so when we have students transitioning at four or five years old people might say isn't that very young to know and Really, for, for most people, they have an established sense of their gender identity by the age of four, often as early as one or two. Um, and this doesn't mean that every transgender person knows that they're transgender. As a toddler, you know, oftentimes people don't have the language to express that, that the language is getting more accessible. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't know that there was a word for how I felt, so I couldn't really express that. But in other ways, just knowing that my gender identity was different from my sex assigned at birth. So like I said, you know, there's no medical intervention when we have students that young transitioning. All of those things are reversible, things like a name change, the pronouns that they use. Um, but there's often a significant level of distress and discomfort when people can't be who they are. And that includes, you know, being treated as just any other boy or girl. If you have a transgender boy, or, um, you know, he's going to want to do things with the other boys, you know, plan boys sports teams and use the boys bathrooms and boys locker rooms and have access to those gendered spaces, which when they don't serve a purpose can be harmful, but there are also gendered spaces that we know can be beneficial, but just making sure that transgender students and non-binary students and gender non-conforming students have options and access to these spaces um, to just, you know, have a good school experience. Thanks, Landon. 
So Matt, I think that um, it might make sense to move to the next section now, and then we'll hopefully have some time for Q and A. But again, people should feel free to use the chat for comments or questions that are coming up. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you, Landon. It's actually a great segue into um, some of the more technical pieces that we'll run through on the design side of things. But I did just want to recap all of that, that fantastic um, input that we received and, and heard about. Just to respond to one of the questions that we've been hearing a lot as we go through this process in terms of proposing all gender toilet rooms. And the question is, well, how many students does this affect? Um, and I, I think you can get a sense um, from what we've heard today that there are, there are many students that are affected. And really, if there is one student that's affected, we all have a, a responsibility as designers uh, to make sure that we're creating an environment in a school um, that is comfortable for that student. Um, and it, it really is something that affects um, a large number of students um, and is really something that needs to just come into the consciousness of our design process as we move through things. Um, so I'm gonna do a very quick, brief history uh, point here. Uh, just to point out the fact that it was actually this Tremont House Hotel project back in Boston in 1830 um, that was the first instance of a segregated gender um, public facility. Um, and not that the toilet rooms were um, started here, but I thought this was interesting only in that it ties to our uh, locality. And if people are interested in really understanding the full history of, of how the gendered public facilities and bathrooms have evolved, um, there is a wonderful um, account of it on the stalled uh, website um, down here. Um, if you just do a quick Google search for stalled, um, you can browse their website. It's a, a wonderful group of people that have really been looking to advance all gender uh, toilet room designs and thinking um, really at, at the public level, uh, maybe not as focused on schools, uh, but is really a great resource on this particular topic. Um, and we're going to talk about now some of the, the code impediments that exist. Um, and it's worth noting here that in the state of Massachusetts, um, there's um, a, a state plumbing code that we all have to adhere to and design to. Outside of Massachusetts, however, there's an international plumbing code, um, or referred to as the IPC. Um, and interestingly enough, um, there is a, a, a very early preamble uh, section in the IPC, or there was, um, that talks about separate facilities. And so there is code language in the IPC that really prevents um, the design of all gender facilities. It is interesting to note, though, that in 2019, uh, that stalled group actually was successful in getting amendments to the IPC that do allow for all gender toilet rooms. And we'll, we'll go through that in a moment. Uh, but it's it's noteworthy here to understand that um, outside of our state, um, there, are, there is movements um, to allow all gender toilet rooms to really be built um, in full code compliance without variances, um, without code changes. So then to focus in on, on Massachusetts and understand where the impediments are in our plumbing code, um, there's, there's two um, key pieces that we actually have to understand and, and work our way around or understand how to get changed. Um, the first is actually something that I think was, is really well intended um, in that Massachusetts state plumbing code actually does have language in it um, that was recently added um, over the course of the past five, 10 years. Um, to allow for um, what they term as gender neutral toilet rooms. Um, and this, these are really the single user rooms that um, people may be familiar with in, in many buildings um, in public facilities um, as it is now allowed by, by code. Um, the key here, however, is that their definition of gender neutral toilet room is one that contains both a toilet and a lavatory. Um, so this means that if we were to be trying to design stalls, uh, multi-user stalls, every single one of them would actually have to have a lavatory inside of it as well as a toilet. Um, and when you talk about the number of toilets that we end up designing in school buildings, um, that really becomes challenging in terms of space utilization to be able to provide an individual stall with toilet and lavatory or sink um, for every one of them. So it, it does provide an, an impediment towards um, designing a more inclusive restroom facility. Um, and the other one, which is interesting, um, is the requirement for urinals. Um, so this is specific to mass plumbing code. Um, it's not a requirement in the IPC, and it's specific to the educational use group in the mass plumbing code. Um, and the key phrase um, that is worth noting is down here that for um, elementary school or any school uh, use, um, that urinals are required to be in addition to the required toilet count. Um, and it, this is probably routed in some type of efficiency that uh, in terms of the uh, genesis of the language, but 
Um, it means that you cannot design a, an all gender toilet room that has only toilets in it, that it, there's actually a requirement to have urinals. Um, and so that's something else that uh, will need to get changed to allow us to um, build, um, again, inclusive restrooms. So to move on now and look at actually some um, designs of toilet rooms and what the implication is in terms of plan and how we approach laying out um, spaces. Um, I first just wanted to share with everyone sort of what is more or less understood as a, a typical quote unquote or traditional type of binary gendered toilet room. Um, so this is um, for multi-users uh, would incorporate toilets um, on the girl's side and it would involve urinals um, and toilets on the boy's side as is required by the mass plumbing code. Um, and then you would also have a, um, a standalone, in this case, gender neutral single user toilet room um, located in proximity. So it's interesting to note that with the, the state plumbing code, you would actually need to have two of these single user um, gender neutral toilet rooms next to each other because we're required to actually replace um, gendered fixtures in kind. And so for every uh, boys fixture, we would replace with a single, gen single gender neutral toilet room. We would also replace a girls. Um, and so there would be a pair of these. But the challenge, and I think what we've heard is that the, the single user toilet room um, really creates the sense of other um, for the users that are going to that particular room. Um, and so it, it actually stigmatizes them by the person that is using that room is sort of outing themselves as um, choosing a particular um, uh, facility. And the intent behind the toilet rooms in a school should really be that anyone can use any toilet fixture they want without having to have any um, indication of gender. Um, that, that is really the goal um, as, as we look at how to ideally design facilities. And so this particular model um, is really what we would consider more of an all gender approach. Um, so here you see that we have toilet stalls that are located um, around the perimeter um, and a shared lavatory area in the center um, so that you can circle around and through um, without having to um, approach one side or the other side. It's really um, a free flowing environment. Um, the other difference that you see here um, is in terms of the toilet stall partitions. Um, so if we go back to that prior um, sort of, again, quote unquote, typical multi-user room. Um, this is what you will find in the majority of um, school facilities, which is a toilet partition that starts probably a foot off the floor and is maybe five feet high. And um, what we need to do is provide privacy uh, within those individual toilet stalls. And so these are full height partitions. And that's the, in addition to the layout and the type of fixtures, um, one of the key design features of an inclusive all gender um, toilet room. And just to give you a sense of what that looks and feels like um, down sort of from an eye level perspective, uh, they're, they're nice spaces. Um, they're, they're spaces that are welcoming um, that all, and that also offer the sense of privacy that is really needed um, to make everyone comfortable that would be using this particular type of room. Um, and to give you a sense of just some precedents that actually have been built, um, there are none that we're aware of in terms of a, a K-12 environment that was purposely um, designed as an all-gender toilet room. Uh, but this one is uh, proximate in terms of geography located down at RISD um, in Rhode Island. Um, and you can see it here. It offers um, a, a shared lavatory area that does not have a separation in the center. Um, and these are um, individual rooms as opposed to individual stalls. Um, and then some examples from the West Coast um, in terms of um, a higher ed um, application for it, but also a high school application. Um, again, just some different um, configurations showing uh, separate toilet compartments um, in addition to a shared lavatory area out in the, in the center. And to focus in just a, really quickly on, again, on the toilet stall um, decision-making process, um, the, one of the issues um, or the rationale behind why traditional toilet stalls are used in schools as they are um, is just to allow administrators to um, assist students that are potentially in distress. Um, you really, with that 12 inch or 10 inch height down at the base, um, you always have the ability to actually go underneath the stall if you had to um, and assist students. So that's always a consideration. It will be a consideration moving forward. Um, but there are um, accommodations that we can make to the hardware, um, to the stalls, um, and potentially still leaving a little bit of a gap um, down at the bottom of the door, um, say a four inch gap 
um, to allow some acoustic access to understand if there are students that are in distress and need help. Um, but we do have two different options um, for um, a more private approach. Um, one um, using a full wall construction and sort of full door to create the toilet stall itself. Um, so this provides a little bit more durability, um, but also comes with some additional costs associated with it, um, just given the hard wall construction. Um, but they do also make um, tall toilet partition uh, construction that you can use. These are sometimes referred to as European style because this is um, where many of them are used, um, but they can still provide um, the necessary privacy um, and offer a little bit more flexibility in terms of um, just the construction itself. One thing to note is that when we do go to um, these private stalls, we do need to account for dedicated um, lighting within them, fire protection, exhaust, smoke, vape detection, um, anything that needs to be sort of compartmentalized within that. So there are some incremental facility costs associated with moving in this type of um, direction for the toilet stalls themselves. I mean, I think we heard also about the, the importance of signage, really. Um, and here you can sort of see the spectrum of um, what traditionally gets designed and, and installed for a binary gender restroom. Um, if it's multi-user, um, as well as in the center, um, what had historically been used uh, for the gender neutral restrooms. Um, and on the right hand side, um, really the preferred model for signage, um, which is an all gender approach um, in spirit, because um, it really removes the whole notion of a, a gendered um, icon that's on that sign. And it really just talks to the function of the room. And that's, again, the goal of what we're all aiming for. So to touch on locker rooms very quickly, and I know I'm going to pass through a lot of this um, in a more expedited manner, but I am hoping that we have a couple minutes at the end for some discussion um, back and forth because it's an important part of this. Um, locker rooms um, are a little bit more challenging we found to be able to implement and design for just because there is a lot of um, sort of social um, just it's not stigma, but it's sort of just built in norms uh, that people have a little bit more difficulty getting over than with the toilet rooms themselves. We think that one of the, the key considerations on the locker room side of things is making sure that privacy um, is, is considered throughout. Um, so whether that means um, thinking about toilet stalls that are embedded within the locker rooms, having um, full height um, and full privacy associated with them and additional space within them. Um, or whether it's thinking about toilets or shower stalls um, in that same type of capacity. Um, it's, it's really one of the most important aspects of how we um, look at locker room spaces themselves. And I'll show just a couple of diagrams here um, to illustrate what we've been going through as part of our, our Waltham High School project. Um, just to show what the, the thought has been. Um, I'll mention that none of these are actually where we ended up, but this has just been illustrating some of the issues and dialogue that we've been having. Um, the components that we need to account for in the locker rooms are the lockers themselves um, and sort of the associated changing areas that potentially come with them. Um, showers, if we're at a high school level, because those are again required by mass uh, plumbing code. Um, and, and then potentially some toilet rooms that are really embedded within. Um, and so this, this type of um, layout would be adjusted, whether it's a middle school or a high school. Um, elementary schools don't typically um, incorporate locker rooms into their uh, facilities. So the way that um, we can look at these is to really try to break down the various components. And these, um, all these diagrams are gonna show boys and girls um, areas, um, but in an ideal world, again, there would, there would not be that condition. There would be an all gender um, sort of changing area where lockers might be incorporated um, and then showers um, and toilet rooms that would be located outside of that um, would really be private um, and sort of located in proximity to uh, the locker rooms. But uh, we did go through a long series of discussions um, with the administrators in Waltham um, and the, the athletic staff as is really all the in, involved parties um, associated with the locker rooms themselves to try and figure out um, an approach that would work. Um, and we, we did end up sort of reverting back to the single user um, analog of the, of the toilet room for the locker rooms where they have um, separated um, shower rooms that are in proximity to, um, but not immediately adjacent or not, not located immediately within. So we think that there's still work to do here on the locker room front um, as we push forward. 
Um, and so we just wanted to mention that there are um, these various considerations that we need to grapple with here in this particular um, arena as well. So um, in terms of how to approach um, toilet room design in schools currently, um, where we have a Massachusetts State Plumbing Code that does not necessarily allow us to build the all gender model, um, we wanted to talk through some of the accommodations that can be made. Um, so what you see on the left and right hand side here um, are essentially the same toilet room. Um, so what we've been designing in Waltham is really a flexible type of layout um, that can get um, really easily reconfigured um, from a binary gender configuration to an all gender configuration. Um, and that would really be by the removal um, of individual wall sections um, that can happen later in construction. Um, we can even design in knockouts in the wall um, so that even after the school is built, um, someone can return to and sort of remove that section um, if, if needs be. Um, but what it allows us to do is, is build a facility that is code compliant um, in terms of having um, a boys and girls area and really not, um, not violating the, the first um, code requirement for gender neutral toilet rooms having both a, uh, a lavatory and a um, toilet. And what it does do, however, though, is have um, all toilets as opposed to urinals. So just as, as a brief anecdote, um, we did for Waltham go and try to um, get two variances to allow us to design um, the all gender toilet rooms um, really in the model on the left hand side that you see here. Um, we were soundly rejected, I would say, by the, by the plumbing board as part of that process, um, saying that this really would in, involve a plumbing code change to be able to build this type of facility on the left. Um, so we went back to them and actually re requested just the, the um, variants for using um, all toilets as opposed to urinals in the boys' rooms, um, and were granted that variance. So we are allowed at this point to now build this model on the right-hand side that has no urinals. It would initially be signed as boys and girls room. Um, but what we're hoping for as we move forward in the process is that we're gonna be seeking a code change um, that will really remove the requirement for the, um, for the gender neutral toilet room model um, and will allow us to build what's going on here on the left. And if that code change is successful, that will mean moving forward that all schools um, can really um, build an all gender toilet room facility um, without um, having to go through a variance process. And so that is really the ideal and what we're hoping for. And again, to just give a sense of how the typical toilet room would potentially get modified um, to allow for an all gender um, circulation flow, um, that wall on the right hand side, simply removing it and allowing for a circular um, uh, movement throughout. Um, and then ease and choice of, um, of stalls um, would be the ideal. And one last consideration in terms of how the all gender toilet rooms would be incorporated into the overall school design. Um, we've taken the opportunity um, at Waltham because we have a fairly large school um, to really um, provide um, diversity in terms of the, the types of toilet rooms that we have. Um, and so as we move up, we have actually three floors that are um, somewhat typical to what you see here. Um, and what we've done is actually alternated back and forth uh, the all gender toilet rooms um, on one side or one side of the wing, um, and then the binary rooms on the other side. Um, and as we move up to the building, we sort of flip flop the locations of these um, to provide flexibility because we know on day one that um, maybe not everyone is comfortable using the all gender toilet room and someone will wanna be able to still use those binary rooms. Um, the nice thing, again, if we design in a flexible manner is that the school and the district can actually change that over using signage um, in the future, ideally, um, if it just becomes the case that everyone is comfortable using that all gender restroom, they look and feel very similar. You can open a hole in the wall um, and convert it. Um, I think as we move forward um, over the course of the coming years, um, we may get to the point where we're building this um, in 2024 as all, all gender rooms. I think that's our ideal. Um, but as it stands right now, we're building something that is um, code compliant and it allows for flexibility moving forward. So I know that was, again, apologies, a little bit abbreviated, um, 
but I did want to now take a little bit of time so that we can open it up to some discussion and questions. Thank you very much for sharing. And um, I'm sure everybody here really appreciates uh, how um, comprehensive this was, not just with hearing the stories and in, in, in the detail and getting uh, a bit more information, but also seeing the design efforts and even in the face of um, obstacles, the, the planning forward beyond uh, and for um, a future that, that will, will come eventually. Um, I can see in the in the chat box that there is it may be a question that's already been answered, um, but Sarah Elsa uh, Beach was asking how you're thinking about urinals in all gender restrooms, um, which are far more water efficient. Um, we have found using toilets negatively impacts our low water use goals. And later in the string, um, Bobby Main answers, and I didn't know if you wanted to comment, but uh, that he's seen. Um, uh, possibly the designation of stalls uh, with, with signage for which ones might have urinals as, as a, an option. Uh, I invite anybody to unmute themselves um, if, if you would like to uh, explain a little bit more on that or Matt, if you would like to respond. Yeah, and thank you for the questions, uh, Sarah and Bobby. Um, and I'd be remiss as well if I didn't mention that there was, uh, Bobby ran a, um, a similar session um, I think it was just last week um, on the larger topic of public restrooms. I know that particular question about the, the use of urinals came up there. It, it's a fantastic point that there are sort of sustainability implications to omitting urinals from um, the toilet room design as we go forward. Um, so it, it's something to be considered um, in terms of the overall calculations, what we're looking for. Um, and there, there are various trade-offs similar to that in terms of um, just different design considerations that we need to weigh against each other. I think if, if urinals do want to be incorporated in that, that approach of potentially putting a sign on the stall um, and making it part of a private stall um, is, is a great way of, a, of thinking about it. Um, we would just need to balance the, um, the required number of fixtures still um, that would have access for everybody because we want to make sure that the, the fixture count um, can adequately serve everyone. So we just need to make sure that the toilet stalls themselves are um, significant in quantity. One of the questions, Matt, was at what came in land and feel about these designs. And I'm going to be very selfish since it's our project. I was really curious what they felt. And, and someone asked about color schemes and I thought that would be interesting too to hear from Cameron Landon. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like was said earlier, you know, privacy is the big concern more than anything for for all students, not just transgender students. So I think, you know, having all gender bathrooms like that is much more normalized than even if you have a single stall gender neutral bathroom, sometimes that still is sort of othering to some students. Although, I mean, some students do prefer that for, for a variety of reasons, but I think with these all gender ones, it is much more normalized. It's not like a designated space for trans students. So I think having the the privacy and also the option like in the locker rooms for gendered spaces is a good like medium where if people are uncomfortable having an all gendered bathroom, they can use the gendered side or they can use the all gendered one. And it's not like people have to, it's not just the transgender students who are making that choice for themselves. So I think that that, you know, on a wider level, you know, students have, anxieties around using the bathroom at schools for all different reasons. I mean, it's an unmonitored space. So that is where, you know, bullying or something might take place. So I think with the, the privacy concern is, is the number one thing. Um, but I think that those designs definitely, you know, make it much more normalized and not as separate or segregated as some of the other options of single stall bathrooms are. I'm not sure how, how Kim feels about it. I completely agree. I'm so encouraged by these designs, um, especially around the privacy piece and also the forward thinking about how these codes are potentially going to change. And, you know, if we can change the walls or make these small changes that will create gender neutral restrooms. Um, it's really encouraging to see that planning in there. It also gives us time for some of the um, conversations or cultural shifts that, that might need to happen in some of these school buildings. So. I think this is fantastic. Um, and in terms of the color question, I really like the RISD design with the many different examples of color. It wasn't gendered at all. I thought that was very creative. So I appreciated that example too.
we have a, another question here and forgive me um, from Mike um, for locker room design. The ideal is to go all in universal design, maximize the number of people that feel comfortable, also save space, but not having to design universal in male and female locker rooms. Any tips on leading clients through this decision? I wish I had some tips that I could point to to say that they were successful to this date. I, I guess I would go back to the notion that we experienced uh, that there was a little bit more pushback on trying to create a more inclusive model for the locker rooms than we were finding on the toilet rooms. Um, I, th I think we can we can just go forward with this type of advocacy and try to um, again make more folks aware of the issue because I think generally um, the pushback comes when there's just a lack of education of understanding on, and of empathy uh, for the folks that um, are experiencing um, the the school buildings in a way that um, is causing hardship and I, I think if people can hear and understand that. Um, a lot of times that will shift minds and hearts um, towards um, allowing a, a more inclusive design model to um, be put in place. But it, it's tough without having um, their ability to understand it. They're, they're falling back really on gender norms um, and sort of cultural norms. And it's, it's challenging a lot of times to have those conversations without um, having this type of context that we're having today. And I think I think Larry's Larry's question is related to that, and it I think it really speaks to some of the fear and the newness around this. And um, we like to say that fear may be the way the day begins; it's not the way the day ends. That fear doesn't have the last word. And I think that the courage of the young people and the families that have spoken up are such an inspiration to us. That fear does not come in the way of being your authentic self. And I couldn't agree with Matt more that um, it's really the development of empathy and creating the space for this conversation. And I think, Ann, you asked uh, such an important question. You asked, do you find that the advocacy is coming from designers, architects, or school leadership, or both? I think it's coming from all places. Sometimes it's the families and the students, sometimes the school leadership. And in this case, Matt has been like this champion and Matt's very modest, but boy, has really been committed to having these conversations and not giving up. I mean, in some way, I tell you, watch the film Norma Ray. I'm kind of dating myself, but I feel like uh, that these are the inspiring, that this is really an issue right now where it's taking education and people can change. And I've been doing this work as, for decades now and there's support in unexpected places. I mean, I uh, we just had a, a young woman who transitioned in fourth grade, a girl that her mother called the principal and he was a Vietnam vet that had been a green beret. And the mom said, my daughter, my son at the time is not going to come back to school until April after April vacation as a girl. And I want her to use the girl's bathroom. And the principal, three months before retirement, his first resp immediate response was, I'm so glad this is happening on my watch. I will do anything that's possible for your daughter to feel safe and supportive at this school. So we often have stereotypes and people rise to the occasion. I think if we approach these, first of all, create the space to have the conversations not let fear drive it and to approach the conversations with the intention of kindness and curiosity and compassion and giving people the benefit of the doubt. Most of the time people rise to the occasion and are really looking for the same thing that um, creating a space where um, some of the stories we heard don't happen and creating more options and being creative. So that's why I'm really excited that Matt created this space in BSA today because all of you can be the people to make sure that these conversations take place. So. Thank you. And I might add to that, Jeff, I think one of the lessons learned is to just be as broad based with the advocacy within the community as possible. Um, so we really need to talk to students, we need to talk to teachers, we need to talk to parents. Um, and when we're talking about trying to have this connected in any way to a, a community vote, um, that's, that's one of the critical pieces to make sure it's not just something that's getting approved or disapproved at um, either an administrator level or at a building committee level. Um, it really needs to be broadcast uh, throughout the entire community with this, this type of mindset and advocacy to, to help share the, the rationale behind it. Uh, Matt, I'm wondering 
uh, if you have had to seek approval from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for doing this in your design? No, there, there's nothing I'm aware of that from the DESE side of things would preclude this type of um, approach to the toilet room or the locker room design. I, I think even maybe to the contrary, we've we've heard from various folks um, at DESE, I mean, Jeff and sort of consulting to them and, and others that um, trying to make sure that all students feel well. Goal is their mission is. Um, so I think they're actually um, very supportive of uh, this type of uh, facility design. If others have other experiences, that would be great to hear about as well. Uh, but I mm -hmm. think that is the, the DESI stance, if mm -hmm. I can be so bold as And to... we're certainly a resource for you around these conversations. Please contact us and, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, come to meetings. Um, we're, this is the work that we do, is to help people to um, partner with each other, to bridge differences with respect, openness, to create the space for the conversations, just like an example of what we did today. So, um, and so please utilize us. I put the contact information for the program and my contact information. Um, we're happy to talk to you about how to have these conversations in a respectful way. And as, as people know, we're living in a larger context where this is the, the political terrain that we're navigating. And um, it's important that we model uh, how to have these conversations in a respectful way, especially in schools where we are hoping that we're teaching young people how to have these conversations also. Matt and Jeff, did you want to keep going through? There's a there's more questions in there. Thank you for posting that information also, Jeff. Yep, um, that would be great. Uh, Lesia asks, uh, would this new restroom design approach be appropriate for both middle school and high school? Are there different developmental considerations that should be considered? It, it's a fascinating question. Um, I, I think it, it would be appropriate. Um, and it's it's something where I, I heard the, the comment earlier that um, in the kindergarten rooms always have been all gender in just about every new school facility I think I can ever remember being built because it's just a single user toilet room that's located directly off the classroom. And so, yes, there is somehow a change that happens from, from that grade level um, as we get to the older grades. But um, I don't think that there's any difference in terms of the desire of a student to use a toilet room. I think we've heard that um, today um, very poignantly um, that makes them feel um, that they're entering a safe space and a comfortable space and just really not having to give um, a thought to that, the particular notion of gender as they're selecting um, where they're going to go to the bathroom. So it I, I do think it would it would be fine um, for any age group, uh, but it would be interesting to have further conversations as the larger design community um, with um, younger students also as we go through just to see whether or not there's um, any consideration that can be given a modification hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. For elementary schools as well, Matthew, I mean, certainly the experiences that we heard today and I just was talking to an elementary school was very similar to the, the post that Larry put in the chat here where the principal said, you know, that he wanted to um, have, they're, they're moving in in May into a new elementary school and uh, building. And he said he wanted to have all gender multi-stall bathrooms as an, an option. And um, the fear stopped it from moving forward. And it sort of breaks my heart when I hear that in a brand new building to hear the, the money that's put in and it's not state of the art. And it might create hardship in the, you know, immediate future, if not um, down the line whether fixtures have to be changed or because of the students who are negatively impacted by it. But it and I think that we as designers can also um, have an eye towards flexibility there as well. And so it, hopefully, as you could see from the Waltham toilet rooms, I mean, there's a way of designing a toilet room so that it can be easily modified in the future to really function as an all gender environment as opposed to a binary gender environment. So even if um, it's not something that will be accepted by the school community or the larger community initially, um, having something that can be easily converted is something we can do um, to really set, set that school up um, to allow for a more inclusive environment down the road as 
again, hearts and minds change moving forward because it, this this is the, the trend um, that we can see moving towards in a larger society. So we just wanna try and uh, Yeah, I mean, I think that part of, we lost you there for a moment, Matt. Nope. Yep, you're back. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I agree with you that this is about, you know, it's about challenge, it's about educating people. And in some cases, challenging stereotypes and myths and misinformation. I was just in touch with my colleague at the Michigan Department of Education this morning and she said they're having similar conversations regarding what their state plumbing code is and um, uh, creating more inclusive spaces. So we're really a model here um, and what we develop here in the conversations that we are having is groundbreaking. And that's really exciting because I really feel like this is, has the potential to really make a huge difference for, for students, um, all students. So thank you for creating the space for this conversation. And oh, here's some other questions here. Kim and Landon, are there any other spaces we should be thinking about going forward that might be subject to a deeper dive to encourage inclusivity? Um, I mean, as far as gendered spaces go, I think, you know, bathrooms and locker rooms are the big ones, but, you know, overnight accommodations, I think, are the other aspect of it, you know, rooming students based on gender identity and not sex assigned at birth and having options for all gendered housing, um, you know, might be really the other piece of this as far as like gendered spaces for that are that are segregated, like architecturally. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, I think in like K to 12 public schools, the the main gendered spaces are usually the bathrooms and locker rooms. And then obviously, like, you know, there are other gender aspects of schools that don't necessarily relate to the building itself, like things like graduation gowns and clubs that might be segregated by gender or sports or things like that. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure if, if Kim has any other thoughts on that. Um, but I think the big ones really are the bathrooms and locker rooms. And that's something that, you know, we see students having significant issues around like avoiding those spaces, which can result in you know, mental health issues as well as like medical issues, like, you know, kidney infections or UTIs or things like that. I, I think that the one thing that I'm not sure, Matt, maybe you could speak about this or people could chime in in the chat. I am often, um, I, I often see, I go in and I see single stall bathrooms that are gendered. And when I bring up, how come, how about if making these all gender, these single stall bathrooms, people are like, oh, we hadn't thought of it. And we're talking about brand new buildings going in where I think that I don't see, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm missing something, but I think that the goal should be that every single stall bathroom being an all gender um, bathroom, a uh, single stall bathroom, I find, especially you see it in these elementary schools where they have these single stall bathrooms that are gendered for the faculty and it's almost all female staff. I mean, we have some work to do there. And so they're using the other bathroom too, saying, listen, we're using this bathroom anyway, you know, like no one's using it, but it, it creates such a message to have these be gendered, like, oh, that's just the way we've always done it. Instead of somebody just saying, hey, how about if we just make these all gender bathrooms? I think that could go a long way even. I've gone into brand new schools where I've gone in and right in the main entrance there, single stall bathrooms and they're gendered. And I'm like, why are these bathrooms gendered? It's like a single stall one. We're actually moving forward to a multi-stall all gender. But so that's one thing I would say is just as a first step, just looking to make as many of the bathrooms all gender as possible that are single stall as well as um, the multi-stall bathrooms. And then the other area is certainly that we're dealing with a lot is in uh, summer camps and changing some of their facilities. It's kind of like the school version in the summer and certainly with the overnight accommodations concern. Um, so we're, we're happy to be a resource for that as well. We are closing in on our time. I know there's a few more questions. Um, Amy had asked about research or resources. Um, and I think you may have answered that Jeff, um, at least providing some of uh, the connections to 
the Safe Schools Program and to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, CJ Wilbur and, and Barbara had spoke uh, or put in a message um, a bit ago that um, uh, talked about the single stall be also being very helpful for students with physical differences and disabilities who may need assistance in the bathroom. And um, I see here that, um, Well, I think to that point, I think, you know, and, and it, it came from Barbara at MSBA, so it's, it's a good question because we all struggle with the net to gross multiplier, right, on these schools and the single stall utilization and square footage demand for use is much higher. So if you were to get rid of all gender bathrooms or boys and girls binary bathrooms as we show them for the multi stalls and went to all stalls, all single stalls throughout, you're going to be adding considerable square footage. And that's a lot of space. Um, to consider and, you know, is it meeting the goals and the um, intent that we're trying to meet by saying that we're providing all gender bathrooms and everyone is equal when we're saying everyone is separate. So I think, you know, that is a challenge. Um, I understand the, the concerns Barbara has, but there'll always be the handicapped stalls and the larger stalls within those multi-stall bathrooms for someone with disabilities or considerations. And I do think the full stall with the privacy features that are being considered really expand that to all students, regardless of gender, regardless of uh, um, medical issues um, and, uh, you know, bathroom shyness. And I think that it just starts to, to dismantle the concern and the anxiety that everybody might have for using a bathroom. So I think that's, you know, space is always going to be a consideration. And, and that I think it sort of separates us instead of bringing us together. If we look at all, you know, all single stalls. That's my perspective, but um, I think it's just something to consider. You know, I just want to also say there are several schools that actually already have um, uh, all gender multi-stall bathrooms. Uh, Lexington Public Schools in their high school, they have um, several and they were actually on NPR talking about it um, a year or two ago and talked about how um, that process unfolded and there was a little bit of uh, conversation the first week and then it became just the norm with, with, with no problems. I know Roger in your school at Greater Lowell, uh, one of your previous schools had all gender multi-stall bathrooms. So um, there certainly are examples and we're going to be collecting that information. So you could be an incredible resource for us to let us know how this conversation's unfolded. So please be in touch with me if you are anywhere in the process around these conversations, because you, I'm, I'm from the positive, positive psychology framework that what does it look like when it goes well and how do we create more of that? So what do the conversations look like that are productive and where are you already finding that schools are doing this and successful? And we, as I said, are gonna be collecting data on those schools so that we can should have that available to you. So you'll be like, oh, this actually happened in the school. Call them and ask how that went so that people who are afraid or this is new feel like you're doing something not only to inform them, but to improve their comfort and confidence level around this topic. So um, it's already happening too. It's just, um, uh, we, can, we can help to get that out there and get the code eventually, hopefully changed um, uh, sooner rather than later, even though it's going to be a process in order to support some of these structures that already exist. That's great, Jeff. And I think it's very powerful to have districts talk to districts. Um, with that, I, I, I know the conversation could continue. Perhaps we have a part two, a follow-up and we see how things evolve. I think this has been great. I wanna thank uh, Matt and the team, um, everybody that's here, uh, Roger, Jeff, um, uh, others for sharing. Um, this has been great. I think very informative this has been one of our better sessions. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very thank much. You. Really great.